Well, today I want to share 10 products from Amazon that really have made my life so much easier. Now, I say they're from Amazon, but obviously if you can find them at a local store, at a local purveyor, then that is absolutely great. It's even better. And if you can find them already used at your local Goodwill or your secondhand store, that's the best. But I just find that for me, some of these were recommended to me by other people and they just me the Amazon link. So I'm going to include as many of the links as I can up above in the cards or up above in the cards. Um, and also uh, we'll put them in the description below. Now some of you may follow me on Instagram and if you do then we have also started putting all of these links in my Instagram stories. So if you want to head over to Instagram I'm under Potage blog or you can just look for Linda Vodder Potage blog. You can sign up there, subscribe there and obviously I hope you subscribe to this YouTube channel. So there you go. Here are 10 products that have made my life so much easier. The first is this stainless steel drying rack. It's got this kind of rubber coating around the perimeter so it doesn't scratch or in any way kind of deface my stainless steel sink. Now here's why I love it because I'm always watering so many plants in my sink and here's why I really love it, you guys. So I can water them. They remain high. There's more than ample space and clearance below whatever it is I'm watering for it to drain. And more importantly then, it's not just sitting in the recess of the sink collecting water around it um, or if there's food bits in the sink they can get dirty and it's just kind of a it's just kind of a messy hassle. So I love this because they can drain, they can really dry out. There won't be any water sitting in the saucer when I put it back in place. Now this is also great for if you're washing um, fruits and vegetables, anything like that, or if you are just rinsing out a dish, you can just set it on here and it can drain perfectly. This is really inexpensive and it's my number one recommendation to make your life easier. Make sure to check out the link. Well, Stuart told me that he answered the door and he said, oh, it's library Linda or studious Linda today because I've got glasses on. And that kind of leads me to my second recommended product. I love this, you guys. I had to wait a little bit for it because apparently it's very, very popular. And that is a sunglasses storage case. Now, I wear all sorts of sunglasses, as you guys well know. Don't judge me. I get a little jolt of joy out of selecting my earrings and sunglasses for the day. But another reason that I love this storage case is because I am very, very myopic. I'm very, very nearsighted. So I also have regular eyeglasses. And then when I have my contacts in, I have to wear readers. So this way it stores all of them in one easy location that I can very readily access as I'm going out the door. It keeps them scratch free. I can enclose it. It's an attractive looking box and there's also space in here for me to keep things like my little cleaning wipes, um, my spray. I also love this kind of spray cleaner for your sunglasses. And so I can keep them all right here, both my eyeglasses and my sunglasses. And then what I can do is just tuck them into this little recess, this shallow recess that's right in my laundry room slash mud room. Another reason I like it is I not only have prescription eyeglasses like these, but I also have prescription sunglasses. So this way, if I'm getting ready to go out and do my fast walk for the day or work out in the garden or whatever, I can take off my regular reading glasses, put them in the same bin as my prescription sunglasses, and then I know where they are and I'm not looking all around the house for where I laid down my eyeglasses. So there you go. There's my next problem product recommendation. I love it. This eyeglass and sunglass storage case. Now most of the 
products that I'm recommending here are because I identified some kind of irritation or some kind of frustration that I have or problem that I have in my life. I know uh, it's not lost on me that these are not major problems, I promise. But these, most of these things are just little things that I could acquire that just made my life a little bit easier. And one thing that I always, I eat lots of buttered toast and I don't like it when my butter is hard and it's difficult to spread. So I got one of these Butter Keeper Crocs. You can get them in different colors. I also got this off of Amazon and you can keep the butter then out on your counter and it remains soft and pliable. So it really corrects that problem of of you know too cold of butter that is very very difficult to spread on your toast i love this it comes also in black and gray for some reason the white was a little bit less expensive but this would make a great housewarming gift or a great hostess gift i think you guys so i love that you just put a little bit of water in the bottom up into the fill line and then you just put it in place and through the miracle of nature or whatever, then it keeps it cool and it keeps it soft and pliable. Now this was not one of the things on my list, but I think it's fun for me to point out to you because I got one of these for Stuart. Was that a Christmas present, Stuart, that I got this for you? Um, but my boys growing up, my husband, Stuart, a lot of times when he comes here, he hasn't eaten breakfast. So he and I will nosh down on a hard boiled egg and I also got one of these egg cookers. I got this off of Amazon also, and it's wonderful because it perfectly cooks hard boiled eggs. You can do a number of them at one time and it just makes it easy and convenient. So Stuart, when we wrap up, when we wrap up this video, we might wanna have a hard boiled egg. So now let's move on to my next product. Okay, so this leads me to my question of the day. I actually have two questions of the day, and that is, I know you guys have products that have immeasurably improved the quality of your life, and I want to know what they are. So please, in the comments below, tell me what products they are not most of these that i'm showing you today are not expensive but they can really drastically improve how you live your life so if you've got recommendations please put that in the comments below and if you've got a link that would be helpful too now my next question of the day comes <laughs> <laughs> from something Stuart just did and I want to know if this drives you a little bit crazy because Stuart does it my husband does it and both my boys do it I don't know if it's just well I don't know what it is if it's a patience thing or what but when you guys Stuart can't figure out where the light switch is on any kind of lamp, whether it's a floor lamp or a table lamp, instead of looking for where the light switch is, you just unplug it. <laughs> And then the next time I go to turn on that lamp, it doesn't work. Then I change the light bulb and everything. And then I realize that it's been unplugged. So let me know if anybody in your life does that, male or female. I'm not male bashing. But it just so happens that all of the males in my life do that. Stuart, <laughs> Stuart I want you to acknowledge that. You, you do that, don't you? And so anyhow, let me know if somebody else in your life does it, which leads me to, in a long-winded way, to my next product, which may be my favorite thing this year. I just love it. So a lot of times when I am looking to solve a problem and I'm looking for a product, I will just search for it. I'll search for it in Google. I'll search for it um, you know, online right now, I'm not getting out and shopping a lot. And so if I don't see it on my regular rounds, when I go to any of my antique stores or thrift stores, then that's what I do. I just kind of search for it online. And when I searched for a long, narrow console table, I may have even put the word metal in there. I came up with this beauty and I love it. It fills this space just perfectly in my office. I'm even considering getting one for my very narrow hallway that needs something for some additional storage. It would be great in an area where you're just getting ready to go outside by your door and you need a place to store your keys or something of, of that nature because it's long slender profile really fits in an area that sometimes could be awkward. So I love this. It came in three different finishes and happily I believe this buff 
uh, buff brass finish, I think was the least expensive one. It was only around $120, which if money is tight, I realize it's a lot of money, but nevertheless, I could have spent a lot more on that by going to a furniture store or something of that nature. So I really love it, and I especially love it because it holds my little collection of orchids that I have here in January. They make me happy, and this is a straight shot from my bedroom into my office so I can see these before I go to bed when I first wake up in the morning and I can see them from my desk. So there you go. This is a long narrow console table that might uh, be a solution for a problem you have in your home. Well, it seems like I cannot talk about this Lash Princess Mascara enough. And I am highlighting this again, even though I have talked about it in the past, because so many of you want to know. Of everything this year, this is probably my best find ever on Amazon. Of everything I've ever bought off of Amazon, this is probably my favorite. Not only because it works wonderfully, it makes it look like you have on false eyelashes, it's also like under $5 a tube. It's the only thing I have on subscribe and save so that I get it regularly. And it comes in two different kinds. This one is, I guess, the false lash effect. And this is called Sculpted Volume. And both of them make your lashes look miles long as if you have on false eyelashes. The only variety of this I may not buy is just the waterproof because I find that is just difficult to remove at night. And also I think it damages your lashes. So if you're one of those, one of the thousands that have asked me about this mascara, this is what it is. It's called Essence Lash princess. Now let's move on to the next thing. Well, as Stuart said, this one has been around for a while, but I only just got it. So first of all, when you've got a whole bulb of garlic and you're wanting to separate the individual sections, then you just hit it with a can. That's a little, little trick. And by the way, this garlic is not the freshest. But one thing that's irritating to me is that when I try to peel it with my fingers, then always this papery film always sticks to my fingers and it's hard to get off. And, and it stinks for hours, yes. And so then you just put it in one of these garlic peelers. You do this and then voila, you get a clove that has been peeled or two cloves. Now, Stuart, I don't know if you know this, but you can, this is one of those kind of absolutely unnecessary things that you do not need to buy. And they'll sometimes sell them as just a block of stainless steel. And you can rub your hands against this block of stainless steel and it supposedly removes the scent of garlic from your fingers. Well, you know what? You can do the same thing if you've got a stainless steel sink. So you just rub your hands on that stainless steel and it helps, not completely, but it does help remove that garlic smell. So there you go. There is my next product, one of these garlic peelers. And if it were Christmas, this would make a wonderful Christmas gift or Chris, a stocking stuffer. So why not buy some now to put in somebody's Easter basket? Really love this. Okay, now this kind of leads me back to my gripe about you guys and men in my life that unplug lamps because Stuart, you did it with these when I first got them. <laughs> because it wasn't really intuitive where you turned on and off these pharmacy style floor lamps. I got these off of Amazon. I have two really expensive version of these, you guys, that I got from Restoration Hardware in kind of a burnished brass. And I love them, but they were pretty pricey. These were at a much greater price point 
and they look good in here and they just really give wonderful task lighting that is directed exactly on your book or whatever it is that you're reading. So this is one of those lamps that Stuart unplugged because he couldn't figure out how to turn it on and off. You can get these off of Amazon. Again, they come in three different finishes. And parenthetically, if you guys do YouTube or anything like that and you need uh, an aux auxiliary light source. Stuart and I love these for when we're shooting. In fact, I think we used some of these yesterday for the Tamron Hall show. They just really make great, flexible, um, mobile light for if you need an additional light source. So there you go, these relatively inexpensive pharmacy floor lamps. Well, here is another product for those of us really of any age, but me in particular of a certain age, and it is a product called Thorn, and this is an iron supplement that actually um, my OBGYN told me about because I tend to be on the anemic side, which I always find out when I go to donate blood, and I need an iron supplement. The other thing that it helps with, and what she actually recommended it for, is I get really bad leg cramps and foot cramps at night, and she said that this organic iron supplement would really be be valuable. So she recommended it to me. Initially, I bought it from her, but actually I found this and all of the Thorn product line on Amazon for a lower price point. And more importantly to me, I, I said that that the mascara was the only thing I had on subscribe and save, but actually I have this supplement on that as well. I don't have to remember about buying it. It just saves it. I know that it's a good quality. It's doctor recommended, and it really helps me tremendously with my iron poor blood and my leg cramps. So if you're looking for an iron supplement that is really safe to use, and by the way, <laughs> Not to be indelicate, but it's non-constipating if you have that issue, um, then this is what my doctor highly recommend, recommended and now I recommend it too. Well, this isn't, doesn't necessarily make my, my quality of life better. Well, I take that back. It definitely does because during the winter, especially during dry January, when we're not drinking any alcohol at all, I really need something that reduces my stress at the end of the day and makes me feel kind of Oh, taken care of. And so to practice that kind of self-care, I love these Harney and Son teas. This is the Tower of London blend. It's really my favorite choice for this year. But there's also another variety that's orange and spice that was gifted to me by my friend Tara up at Channel 4 last year for Christmas. And it's how I found out about this tea blend. And you can actually find it on Amazon. There may be other sources, but this is where I have found it. It comes in really a beautiful canister. And the other thing I like about it is it looks a little bit special. And so you can gift it to others. And I've got some in a box that I'm actually using when I compose this smile basket for a friend of mine who just had surgery. And I think it really makes a really special gift. And that's, and in addition to that, the tea bags are just absolutely beautiful. They're not just your traditional paper tea bags. So I love them. I love their fragrance, and it's just a little way to treat yourself, and that definitely improves your quality of life. Well, this last product category is something that I bought for myself around Christmas time when I was setting up my bar for all of the guests and everything. I love rectangular tray baskets that corral things. And these, uh, I think these were maybe $37. I can't remember for a set of three, but they're really good looking. They're very well made. And these are these rectangular rattan baskets. So I've got them here on my little sideboard 
board tray. I've got one in small, in medium, and then I've got another one over here that's in large. I like it because it protects the surface of this sideboard. It kind of corrals things and it makes it easier to dust actually. So I just love any kinds of trays that will contain things, make them more mobile, and I think really elevate their appearance in my home and in my gardens and just basically in my life. So there you go. There are my Amazon products that I highly, highly recommend. Get them off of Amazon via these links, find them anywhere. But these are things that have drastically improved my quality of life. And here's my last question of the day for you. If you enjoyed this, let me know. I'm considering, even though it's not specifically garden related, but I get so many questions about like what kind of beauty products I use and things of that nature. And I'm no expert, but if you would like me to do a rundown list of beauty products that I use that is similar to the one that I just did, please let me know in the comments below and maybe Stuart and I will put it up on an off day or something along those lines. So there you go. I hope these enhance your quality of life and you found them helpful. Well, here you go. Here's my outfit of the day. Very, very casual today. I've got my glasses on. These are from I Buy Direct. They're a great resource if you want just different kinds of glasses, not at a really high price point. I got these fairly recently and I think they're kind of cute. Um, my earrings came from Burlington Coat Factory. This adorable t-shirt was a gift from my son, Jamie, and my new daughter-in-law, Taylor. Be a good person. Person. There's a brand out of Denver that's called Be a Good Person, I think. You can probably Google it. I love the bright lettering. I think it's really, really fun. Uh, my britches, my cute little britches are Ann Taylor Loft. These are actually thrifted. I got these at Goodwill. And my shoes are Vans. I got these off of Amazon and I think they're kind of fun too. So it's all about being comfortable and casual today. And there you go. There's your outfit du jour. Well, we are going to do something really unusual today. So many of you have asked me if I had pictures of my garden over time, what it used to look like. And I don't have a lot of those because when we first started this garden or when I first started it, um, it that was pre-digital. So the, the early phases of it are largely in hard copy images. And I came across a, a portfolio portfolio of them the other day and I thought it would be fun for us to look back when and then contrast it with what it looks like now. So Stuart's going to have to do some editing on this, aren't you Stuart? I am. But we're, hopefully it will make some sense. So my overall question of the day then is tell me which way you liked it more. Now sometimes these were intentional changes I made and I'll try to explain as we go from vignette to vignette why it changed. Uh, sometimes the changes were intentional, sometimes they were forced by mother nature or for some other reason. But I will definitely give you the rationale for why it looks the way it does now versus why it looked the way it did back when. These, most of these photos were taken in, I think, 2005 and 2008. The date is some on the, is some of the, on some of the images that Stuart is going to scan. The date is on there and we'll try to leave that on there so you guys can kind of compare and contrast. And I'll also try to mention like, please note that such and such wasn't here yet, and that was back in 2005. That is helpful to me because I don't remember the year I planted some of these. I didn't have very good record keeping. Okay, so let's get started. So let's start out with this first long vista of my backyard. It has changed considerably, and you may not notice that unless you really hold one image up against the other. But in the old image, number one, sadly, yes, all of those electrical wires, utility wires are still there. But you'll also notice that in the background, there is a huge tree. I believe that was an elm tree. 
and it was on the neighbor's side. It is not there any longer. It was a beautiful tree, and I think it got a lot of storm damage, so one of the previous owners that lived in that house, they took that tree down, which as you can kind of imagine, really changed uh, the microclimate and such in my, in my own landscape. Now in the corner where that utility pole is, there at one time was a blue atlas cedar, and it's not huge in this picture, but over time it got quite large. It also died in a year where we had very, very intense heat, and then we had very intense cold. But it was there for quite a while, and it helped camouflage that ugly utility pole. It is no longer there. Note also, how the width of the grass. So in the picture, the old picture that was taken April 25th of 2005, you'll notice that the lawn was much wider and here it really narrows. And it was also back when I had long or I had real grass, but notice that the grass is trenched and the edge is just like it was when it was real grass. Now it is that faux turf. And that's one of the reasons I selected the company that I did uh, with this, this product was because they were able to replicate the look that I had in the past. This was also when my boys were younger. Stuart, we might kind of start walking around now. Okay. This was also when my boys were younger and they had more room to play. And we would, Hubs and I would sit on the bench over here, which, which some of you now think needs to be moved because it's so overgrown in that area. But I still, I still like it. It's more of a garden ornament than actually something that's utilitarian, at least at this stage of the growing season. And my kids would play out here. Notice the absence of all of this brick border. That did not used to be here. And I added it later and I think it adds a real textural component. You can see where the white ditzia was, which is right here. And in the picture, you can see that it's in bloom. And in front of that white ditzia, you see a mound of gold. And that was this area in here. And at one time, this was all gold money wart. And it would look great in the spring, but then it would start getting really buggy and it would be overgrown and it was became a maintenance issue. So I removed all of it and laid down this herringbone pattern of brick as kind of a brick throw rug in the foreground of the bench. And then as I was doing the border for it, it kind of gave me the inspiration to continue with this brick border all around the perimeter of the garden. And it's one of my favorite features now. You'll also notice, I think you can tell, at the, in the very bottom of the shot, around where it shows the date, you can see that there was no brick border over here. It just went directly into flagstone. So I like the way it looks much more finished and it looks like one um, more continuous line. You'll also notice that in this area over here, this redbud tree was not there. I'm having to consult the picture as well, <laughs> you guys. The redbud tree was not here. And there used to be a huge mass of roses that literally climbed the studio. And I'll just, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at a different picture. But I really liked the way that this redbud tree, which by the way, you guys, I did not plant. It was a, vo a volunteer. I just noticed where it was as I noticed the redbud tree over here. And I liked the way they flanked either side of the studio. I did not plant them, I just noticed their presence and I started to prune them up so there would be this kind of bower effect over this porch that goes into the studio in the back. But neither one of them was there. You'll also notice back here, this is kind of fun for me too, you guys. <laughs> fun for me too. You'll notice that back here, and Stuart, we might need to just have this photo up well, on there for reference. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll continually go back and forth to okay. it. Okay, and this is kind of a trial and error thing, so hopefully this, this will fun. work. Um, but you'll notice back in here, 
I used to have two large evergreens, two very pointed columnar evergreens. They almost look like Italian cypress, but they were blue point junipers, which I can't remember if they were removed or if they died, I can't remember, but there was a blue point juniper and eventually I, I just removed them. I think it was probably about the corner here but it was, it was these original blue point junipers back from 2005 that started sending out all, the, all of the babies, one of oh, which wow. turned into that's this cool. topiary. So I think that's, I think that's kind of a fun, it's really cool. kind of a fun thing, a little bit of garden history and garden anthropology. You'll also notice that in front of the studio, which would be over in here, there's a mound of yellow. And for the longest time, I had a huge mound of golden oregano, um, oregano aurea, and I had that in here. And it was so happy for many, many, many years. And finally, I think that the quality of the soil just it, it, it just couldn't prosper any longer, but I still love it. And I do look for it because I would like to use it in different containers and things. It looks from a distance very much like um, golden money wart, but it's not. The, in this image, you'll see that it's a very chartreuse color. Over the summer, it would also revert to green and was a little bit more of a maintenance issue. And so I, I didn't put it back, I just, continued this area with flagstone brick and gravel. And then you can see even back then, I loved the way this Boston Ivy, hello Stuart. I'm just waving to Stuart. Um, how this Boston <laughs> Ivy crowed at the base, crawled across the base of the step. And I still like that and I just kind of contain it. And now because the rose is no longer on this wall, I allow it to climb up this wall and I do keep it contained. This is not Virginia creeper, this is that Boston ivy. So let's see what other changes are here. Um, this area over here, you'll see if you look at the picture, it's on the left. There used to be a rose that climbed up this trellis in the back. And when there wasn't so much shade, that rose did great. It was a Gertrude Jekyll rose, which now has a minor presence on the side arbor, but you may have wondered why I had this lattice there. There also at one time was some clematis that climbed up it. Both the clematis finally, after many years, expired due to clematis wilt, and this tall and very beautiful globular arbor vita here, I had a series of three of those just underneath this um, this lattice work and I planted them there to hide the ugly legs of the roses. They were supposed to be a dwarf variety. Obviously it was not a dwarf <laughs> variety as I learned. I removed two of them and then I proved what, pruned what was a tiny shrub up into a large tree and I have to say that I love this now because it needed an evergreen presence and visual weight. It is wonderful in the winter time, and it also gives now the boxwood and things that grow underneath it in the understory, it gives them a little bit of protection. So I think that accounts for most everything in this picture, Stuart. You mm -hmm. wanna move on to the next one? Let's do it. Okay. Okay, probably the most dramatic difference in this photo is the large leaning tree. And you'll notice this was taken in 2006 when I still had real grass. Um, this was taken in 2006 and you'll see that leaning tree where now approximately, Stuart, if you can kind of come over this right. way, now there's a red bud. And I used to have two river birches there that one trunk you see was originally part of a triple trunk river birch that was there. And where are we talking about now? Okay, right here. This tree right here. Okay. Okay. On this picture, 
And right, I'll put that on the screen for you. Right there, okay. That used to be in this area a triple trunk river birch. And over time, in different weather events, we lost two of the triple trunks, and this was the remaining one, and ultimately, it also had to come down because of storm, storm damage. So in its place, I decided to just let a redbud grow because the red redbud is native. It obviously wanted to be there. It planted itself, and over time, it grew up to be this shape. So in 2006, at least, there wasn't a redbud there, and there is now. Mm -hmm. The other thing to point out is you'll notice that I used to have, this is the same table, I've got different chairs there now, I used to have an umbrella there, and I don't have an umbrella anymore because this area is largely shaded, and I don't need it, but just right off the edge of the table and the point of the umbrella, you can see where I planted a blue, uh, a, a blue atlas cedar, and look at how much that blue atlas cedar has grown. Where's that line? Where did the grass end? The grass ended about right here. And then I added this additional space out to here so I would have a complete contour of this bed in one continuous line. So another thing that's different is you'll notice that a lot of my trim, the studio doors and some of the trim to my French doors and to my kitchen window, it used to be painted white. And when we had it repainted, I had it painted in this darker gray, partly because that was a much more English look and also because the white color was just really difficult to maintain. It was a lot more high maintenance. Primarily though, it was an aesthetic decision because it looked a lot more English. So when I did research on Tudor houses, I wanted it to look much more, um, much more English than it was. The other thing to look at, and Stuart's gonna put up two different pictures. There's one in 2006, and this tree here with these beautiful, I love this tree and I love the way the Boston Ivy climbs it. This one was a volunteer and you can see right next to the pot that you see in the picture, it's just a little baby in 2006. And then here is the second picture that's more, uh, more of a close up shot. You can see how much it has grown between 2000 and six was the original picture and in 2008 it has grown considerably. So that's how much growth a redbud can put on in two years. And at this point, the one on this side has not yet made an appearance. So interestingly, this one grew up to approximate the size of its twin on the other edge of the porch in short order. So there's almost pretty much complete symmetry there. You'll also notice, let's see what else is different here, Stuart. Um, you'll also notice that there used to be in this area right here, I used to have two lounge chairs that matched this furniture. And I ultimately removed them because in the summertime, it's just typically too hot to ever really lounge here. We never, we seldom ever used them. And so I gave them to a nephew who had a rooftop, uh, a rooftop patio. I gave those away. And that was when, about that time is when I introduced the topiary here, which have become a very significant signature touch in my garden, I think. And instead of, and it also used to be that this area right here stopped at about right here. And I wanted to create this bistro area after I had to have some major plumbing work done through here. They had to dig all of this up. So I exp expanded this area. I put in more matching herringbone brick to match what was over in front of the garden bench. 
and moved some chairs over in here and created what I call the bistro area now. And the redbud tree that is here now also at one time was a triple trunk river birch to match the one that was on the other side but they both died and it used to be river birch trees were a very popular triple trunk tree that was planted in oklahoma when i first started to garden Say that they three were times fast. yeah they, they were very very popular they are an absolutely gorgeous tree and for a while they were a recommended tree in Oklahoma. No longer because they come down in the ice and the high winds. They're beautiful, but I ended up going with a native that planted itself and I just knew that I liked the presence of a tree there based on what was there in the past that I had originally planted. So now instead of the river birch, I just have a ceiling of redbud but yeah, that's one of the differences I saw is there's not anywhere near as much of a canopy kind of over. Over it's this whole shade, area, which yeah. is why I had an umbrella. And I also, let me see, let me look at this picture. Back then, um, I don't think, I don't think this maple was here either. So now the maple that protects this terra hydrangea, it now comes over and kind of closes the ceiling from this side. Now, before the horrific ice storm we had last oh, yeah. year, this, it was pr almost completely covered. Yeah. And, and actually, as sad as I am that I lost a lot of that coverage, I do about midday, which it is right now, I get enough light on my table that I can have some of my topiaries that um, that like higher light instead of too much shade. So Stuart, should we move on to the next category? I think so. Well, this is one of the most dramatic changes, I think, and that is this whole bed of hydrangeas. When I first started to grow these hydrangeas, first of all, there was a lot more light over here. And believe it or not, hydrangeas, the, the mop head hydrangeas that bloom in, in the purple and the pink and the blue and the deeper hues, they need pretty much more sun than you would think to actually put on intense color. So that's one of the reasons it looks so different because now this area is largely shady. But primarily the reason that they don't look this way anymore and that the, the ones that I do have, and that's another reason, for example, right here, the ones that are blooming are in a paler color instead of a darker color, because this area is shadier. But the other reason is there's not such profuse bloom is because this whole area used to consist of all mop head hydrangeas that bloomed on old wood. And it never used to be a problem that we would get a very early hard freeze or a very, very late hard freeze to kill out the buds and all of these gorgeous flowers. Over the past 15 years, the, uh, the hydrangeas that bloomed on all wood, barely, they, they froze out every single year. They quit reliably blooming, something I had taken for granted. And then they just quit doing that because of, of hard freezes, either very early or very late in the year. So I started putting in varieties. You'll notice there's no white ones in, yeah. in this image. I started putting in varieties that bloomed on new wood, like the Annabelle that's getting ready to bloom over there. And then these other varieties that you can see here they're starting to come into bloom. And these also bloom on new wood. Hard late freezes actually can also be a problem for them, but not nearly as severely so. So these are gonna start, you can see lots of buds. Can you see buds on them there, Stuart? Oh, yeah. yeah, these are gonna be a little bit later and they do bloom in more shade, so they won't have the intensity of the color, which actually I, in, in terms of how they, resonate with the rest of this stand. I like the paler color with the white blooms that are going to be massive and the white of the oak leaf hydrangea instead of those real vibrant, deeper, more intense colors because it, it's a little bit softer and a little bit um, makes more of a whisper. Here is something that this year has been such a problem. 
more than ever. I'm gonna move it before it does any damage. This year, we haven't had a lot, lot of bugs, um, but boy, one bug we have had are earwigs. Let me know if you live in the Oklahoma area if you've had a lot more earwigs. Um, my creative coordinator, Carrie, she said, oh my gosh, this year the earwigs have just been terrible. She's the bug whisperer. And she said they've been really terrible. So let's move on to the next area, though this one I think was pretty dramatic. This area probably changed very dramatically. And <laughs> I have, have named this spot, oh, the exuberance of youth, because I so loved my potage in the back that when this area was very, very sunny, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a small kitchen garden right off of my kitchen and the back stairs? And I put in a tiny second potage with clipped boxwood because at that time that was how I defined it. And I grew all sorts of, of little herbs and things in there. There was at one time a climbing rose that grew up the fence, which way back when I just left natural. And at a certain point, I decided to stain it this dark bronzy brown color. And you guys are gonna ask me what color this is. And we will try to put uh, the lid to the formula of the paint can. Stuart, let's try to remember, we'll put that in the community tab. So you guys keep checking the community tab. Um, and then I decided to add a couple of more red buds because again, I wanted this canopy to be complete. These two I actually planted um, because the others were so mature and I kind of wanted to emulate the same degree of maturity. And I wanted it to be an entire ceiling over this area. And so I just pruned them like I pruned the others. Stuart, if you wanna kind of do a sweep around there, which is just opening up the branching so that there's good airflow through there. You can see, I, this is one of my favorite views of the garden from where I'm standing right here, Stuart, looking back to the light's not great but looking back to the boxwood orbs and the gorgeous hydrangeas, I love this. And then the contours and the architecture of, of the redbud tree. And so this area, just, it just got a lot shadier and I, it was, this was way too much work. And I was so naive thinking, oh, I can keep up with all of this when I had two small children. And I realized, no, I didn't. And it also looked too busy. And was that still I, here? Uh, those, yes, those were there. Exactly as they are? Exactly as they are. Those were there. And there used to be, in front of them, again, before it got too shady, in front of them, there were two large conical boxwoods, which oh. now live in the back in the potage. I transplanted them because they got oversized for this space. And, and so then I just let this kind of devolve. I added more brick. I added some stepping stones and I let this kind of devolve into a much shadier kind of natural garden because I wanted the consistency of the boxwood balls. When you first came in the gate, I added these boxwood balls to repeat and kind of continue the flow of them through the garden and they can handle this amount of shade and they also kind of define this space. And I just like this area, it's just ground cover. It has lots of things that go to seed. The yellow columbine, the purple columbine. In here there is a little bit of purple adenophora which used to bloom a little more heavily. Now it's a little bit shadier in here, but I don't mind. And then because it kind of had a woodland vibe when I lost a lot of the trunks to my oak tree in front, I just placed some of them over here because I just kind of like the way they look. And now this is where I have my terracotta pots and I, it's kind of a nice shady area to select my container of choice. And this whole area is just quieter and I like the fact that when you come in the gate, it's very shady and it creates this kind of arbor. Stuart, if you look up, you can see that there's this, it's kind of a, a pergola or a living arbor. They blend, oh. you can really see how they, they interact with yes, each other. Yes, they interact. So where this blood good red maple then intertwines and creates this wonderful canopy. 
as you come through the gate, yeah, and I how, loved that. Look how solid the shade is. You can look down. Yeah, the, sol the shade is almost solid now, wow. and it also shades a section of the driveway that can get very, very brutally hot. So it makes more of a pleasant entrance that this entire area in the summer is more shady as you go into the backyard, and I really, really like that. So um, this was something that I did envision, and I'll be darned if it actually didn't come to fruition. <laughs> so there's two more pictures for you to look at and oh and by the way here is a tip this was a very old fence and it was up to oh it was probably about this tall and the top of it had gotten just oh it just had started to erode away squirrels had done some damage on it but I didn't want the expense of completely replacing the fence so I came up with this idea of just putting some horizontal boards here cutting off the fence to about this height putting the horizontal boards on and then adding a layer of lattice and then topping it off with some fil some uh, finials and 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 then also having a surface at the top. So what this did was I didn't have to completely replace my fence. This was an inexpensive solution and it worked both when it was still naturally starting to uh, age naturally but also it looks great I think after it after it was darkened up and I really like the way it looks. looks good. Okay let's go on to the next area. So Stuart is trying to replicate this shot exactly, so you can't see my head right now. But this is the corner on the north end of the studio. And you can see that there's a lot of color there, uh, in many ways more color than I have now. And most of it comes from perennials. So there's some stochesia in there, there's some lilies, there's some veronica, there's some daylilies there. It looks like I might even have some yellow lantana in there. There's a, a lot more, um, there's just a lot more perennials. And as part of my less maintenance uh, kind of part of my garden manifesto, I decided to have more blooming shrubs. And then I also just wanted my, my color to come from the containers. And also those perennials were just a lot more to maintain. So I had a couple of boxwood balls in there. They really grew up. Um, there used to be a tiny one right here, and it got destroyed in a storm. But you can notice in some of the studio pictures that the large pots are still here on either end of, of the porch that leads into the studio, and only the contents have changed. Also, you'll notice how much shadier it is over here. This used to be a full sun aspect, and now it's considerably more shady, and that's another reason that there's not a lot of perennials in here, because there's not enough sun to support them. And what sun they get is a, really at the end of the day. A running theme, more shade. Yeah, a running theme, more shade. And I really, I really like that, and I think it adds to the intimacy of the garden. And I honestly do not miss the color from the perennials. Oh, and I'm so glad you said that, Stuart. This is so important to point out. As you're answering these questions and you, you look at the, how it was in the past versus how it is now and which you like better, let me also point out that whenever these photos were taken, it was, they were probably taken right before or right after a garden tour. So it looked its very best at that point in time. Today, I'm not garden tour ready or anything. This is just how it looks today. And I prioritized long-term, everyday good looks over sporadic good looks and perfection for a very short period of time. So this area right here will pretty much look this way all summer long. The image of this corner as it was looked that way for about a week. Let's move on to the next one. Well, this area has really changed. I used to call this area the Rose Bower area because it was just filled in the springtime with a massive, um, just a massive explosion of climbing old blush roses that grew and filled this entire corner. They crawled across the top of the studio. For a while, I used to have a telephone line 
telephone cord that came from the utility pole to the corner of the studio and I would even let it crawl on the on the uh, telephone line and cross the yard and then where that ended a Zephyrin Druin rose began and covered the arbor. What because, a name. Uh, huh? Zephyrin, Zephyrin Druin. Yeah. A beautiful fragrant rose, one of cool. my favorite roses. And there used to be an arbor right here and it would it would climb that arbor. It was and my again, it was when it was spectacular, it was spectacular. And especially it looked very I think it looked very Italian or very English because of the counterpoint of the tall junipers. Um, I remember always wondering when I first started working with you why you had trellises on your roof. Well, I had, and that's because, thank you for pointing that out, that's because the climbing old blush rose used to climb on the trellis, that and I would sense. secure it to the trellis. <laughs> now, for multiple reasons, the rosy bower is no more. Again, when you're looking at this, you think, oh my gosh, these images, that is absolutely spectacular. I definitely liked it better back then. Keep in mind, <laughs> it only looked that way for maybe two weeks max. And after that, it was a tangled mess of rose bushes that I then had to contend with, um, climb on the roof to get them to secure, <laughs> cut back when they started to impale people and impede progress into the potage. But more importantly, uh, the Zephyrin Druin, after many, many years, it suffered rose rosette, which then infected the climbing old blush. I took out the Zephyrin Druin, I took out the original climbing old blush, but it had layered itself and repropagated, so I still have it. And I love that, and now it just crawls across, as it begins to mature, it will continue to crawl across the picket fence here that had to be replaced. Let me see if I get this. Only bloom for two weeks, but it, they're a huge pain afterwards. Yes. Because tulips only bloom for two weeks, but not T as huge a pain afterwards. No, no, and tulips bloom for longer than that. Okay. The progression of bloom is longer than that. Okay. But when you have a mass of roses <laughs> like that. It seems short to me this year. It, 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 <laughs> well, because the tulips, as with the roses, it all depends on the weather. Okay. So. So if I had had those same roses this year, Stuart, mm -hmm. they bloom in early April. If I had those same roses, they would have lasted probably about a week, oh, if today. a week, yeah. because the winds were so strong that they would bloom and then the weather was in the 90s. And so, so they just wouldn't have their good looks for any period of time at all. But the work, the maintenance, the black spot, uh, the Japanese beetles, the powdery mildew, that was a gift that kept on giving <laughs> all through the year. And so for me, I like now the fact that what is here now, again, looks like this pretty much the entire growing season. I do have a spot of roses that bloom instead of the rose that I rose that I had to maintain growing on the side of the studio I now have this ivy which then crawls up the trellis on the roof this is far easier to maintain it likes the shadier aspect as well it has the same English look but it doesn't have all of the drawbacks the other thing is when I planted this rose I was probably in my early 30s. I ain't in my early 30s anymore. I used to literally get on top of that roof. I don't want to get on top of the roof anymore at my age. And so because of that, it was kind of one of those good things, bad things. Once I realized once it was gone, I don't know that I missed it. The other major thing that a lot of you will go back and forth on this, because I know a lot of you really miss the arbor that was here. And it's in, if you, it, Stuart misses it. It was in lots of the images of, of my book. Um, but finally, after being here for so long, it just began to decay and it had to be replaced. And when we replaced it, I, or when we had to rebuild this fence and these posts, I decided I didn't want it back. 
for a number of different reasons. Um, it was a little bit of an impediment to move from one space into the next space because there were four piers here for the, the trellis itself. Um, it really, I think it impeded airflow. It made it difficult to get a wheelbarrow in and out. Um, and then it, but primarily what it did was obstruct the vista, the long view from up closer to the house all the way through and back into the potage. So now Stuart, I can stand here at this point in the garden, the rose isn't there any longer, the arbor isn't there any longer, and when I round this curve right here, in fact, I'm gonna have you come all the way over here. I figured you might, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all. My and by pleasure. the way, you guys, when you watch this, I know this is a long, long video. You might wanna break it up into stages, but I, I have wanted to do this. So many people oh, have yeah. requested. Okay, look at that beautiful vista now. You can see all the way back into the potage. You can see the alliums. You can see the finials. It, depending on where you navigate, you can see the contours of the boxwood. You can see the pickets of the fence. When that rose was there, in this picture, you could see none of that. And in the winter and in the summer, it was just green. Now I have much better air circulation and I can see all the way back through here to my dove coat, to what's going on in the potage. And the other thing that I love about it is it seems like a much larger space than it seemed before. It seemed like it was kind of cramped and kind of pushed up against the east side fence. Now it feels much more spacious, a much larger area, and I think a little bit more befitting the grandeur of, of my house. So let's move on to the potager itself and wrap this up. Now this is going to be a pretty dramatic change, and I have to say in looking at this older picture, it really, really was beautiful at this point in time. Again, this point in time didn't last very long, and I am more about the long term right now. But you can definitely see a number of different changes. First of all, the absence of the rose, it's not here any longer. Um, the arbor is not here any longer. And also, and this was something I really equivocated on, once I put up these posts, and I kind of like your input on this, I decided not to put, you'll see that there's a gate, a gate into the potage that used to be here. And the reason it was here, and it, I love the gate because I designed it to, so that the pickets were tall and then they got shorter and then they got tall again. And I loved that. And I had a little ornament that my mom had given me that I hung on it. And I, the reason I had that gate, it was added later after the um, arbor was built because we had a tiny little dog then and the dog would get in here and then could get out. And so I had to do something to contain her to this area of the garden. So we called it a Billy gate because <laughs> I had a dog named after Billy Holiday, my favorite singer. And we called it a, a Billy gate. We lost Billy, so there was no longer really an, a reason to have it here. And again, I just, because there's so much warping in gates um, as the weather changes and they tend to not open as easily over time, they tend to begin to sag. Um, I just decided that I didn't want that frustration, again, at more ease, and so I didn't enclose this. And I have to say, I really like the fact that it's open. It makes ingress and egress that much easier. And I also like the way now that these large pots, which used to be conical boxwood, which just really began, they just got way too mature and had to be replaced. Now I can have two dramatic pots here as a point of entry. Now right now, you'll notice that it doesn't look nearly as cluttered in this old picture as it does now. That's because I'm in a state of transition, moving pots around, and it's more of a workspace than it is just a beautiful photo shoot ready area. Again, these were taken just prior to either a magazine shoot or a garden tour. So these look perfect. Right now, even though it doesn't look perfect, I still think it looks really beautiful. Some of the other images I wanna show you, you could notice in the back that we did 
I did stain the fence to match that dark color and I like it much better. It tends to just recede instead of standing out. That fence has now pretty much been obscured by the growth of the Nandina behind it and also the ivy which grows on it which gives it a very English look and I can contain it. And I also grew, just to give a little punch of yellow, there's a small leaved golden fortuny euonymus that grows up one of those posts. So, and then I put two, there used to be some in-ground boxwoods there. These were there because I transplanted them from the front area I showed you near the back porch. Um, over time, I wanted to move those and I have two pots that now punctuate the corner. Again, too many pots, it's too busy right now. Everything is in a state of flux. But what amazes Stuart is <laughs> how, how much the boxwood has grown. And that was why I had to take some drastic measures uh, to reduce its size. Remove the boxwood balls on the ends. You used to be able to walk through them. You can't anymore. I widened the brick path that goes into the center. There used to be in the interior at juxtaposition points, I used to have some golden fortuny euonymus. It's not there anymore because it would get scale and I removed it. I, when the boys were little, I would grow different things in the middle. I grew uh, baby boo pumpkins one year mm -hmm. and Jack be little pumpkins and my kids got great delight out of that. But again, that was a lot of work. And then probably the biggest difference is in, is in this border here. And it used to be filled with climbing uh, dawn roses with lots of larkspur, with tons of perennials, with lots of poppies. And there wasn't anything in here to ground this space. Pretty much, once that show was finished, I had to come in here, pull out all the poppies, pull out all the larkspur, because they were just dead and brown. The roses just were a mess, and as much as I love dawn roses, uh, pink dawn roses, they are, a, they are a prickly bear, and they were very difficult to wrestle with, and I just decided that I liked uh, and then I was, it, this Virginia creeper would start to entangle in them and I would just spend hours out here trying to get it to look presentable. I don't have to do any of that anymore. Now there are fixtures in here, my alliums, there's different things that come up every year. And even before I've put in any of my summer seasonal color, it still looks pretty nice, doesn't it, Stuart? Absolutely. It still looks pretty nice. And I've done very, very little to it. I haven't even pruned the boxwood cones that are punctuate either end. I haven't even done that yet. And I also like the columnar contrast of these uh, emerald green arborvitas. And yes, you guys have also commented, excuse me, I just hit my mic. You guys have also commented that you like the way the ivy looks across the top. And I do too, I really like that. But again, it's very, very high maintenance. My neighbor to the back is gonna replace their fence, so it may go bye-bye for a while. But as you all know, it's very, it's very tenacious back. and it will probably <laughs> come back. Um, I just, I'm, I never knew the protege to have to be small. That's why it amazes me so much to see that those images. Small. That at, that at one time I planted all, and by the way you guys I I planted this interior this design. I just eyeballed it. And I planted one gallon wintergreen boxwoods on, on about 15 inch centers after I was in Barnsley House. I talk a lot about that in my book. And I planted it on 15 inch centers and it doesn't look fabulous right now but it still looks pretty good. And as it continues to grow out, it will look even better. And this is kind of the beginning of the summer season. So pretty soon these will all be filled with vegetables and things. And the reason that I didn't plant too much spring stuff in some of them is because I want as much sun as possible to hit the center boxwood and the perimeter of the outside boxwood because I want it to fill in and recover. So there are times, no, I was not going to, somebody said, well, maybe you should just take it all out and replant it. 
no. <laughs> First of all, I have an emotional attachment to this. Um, number two, it may not be perfect anymore, but it's still beautiful. Number three, that would be a huge expense. And number four, I would still be waiting another two years for it to all grow together like this. So I am willing to put up for one year where it looks kind of clunky and, <laughs> and, you know, kind of like an awkward teenager, than to tear it out and have it start all over again. I think it is beautiful regardless, and I love the way it captures the light. It still so, makes me smile almost the same way it did the first time I didn't know it was here, and I saw the rest of the yard and thought, you know, this is great. And then you come back around the corner and realize, go, oh Holy my crap, gosh, this is, more, yeah, this is, and it still this is does all that. back here. It still does it today. And, and I love the way that it's, it's enclosed. I talk a lot about that in the book. If you want to see more pictures of what it looked like back then, then definitely get a copy of my book and you can compare it to real time. But I, I loved it as much then as I do now. Actually, I think I love it more now because it's so much easier to maintain. And I've replaced so many perennials that were high maintenance with blooming shrubs and evergreens. It looks 10 times better all year round than, than rather looking perfect for just nanoseconds in time. And it has, the other thing I love about it is it has evolved and kind of parallels the evolution of my family, myself as a gardener, and as I age along with it. So that concludes our garden design makeover. That was before, this is now, and I'll be so curious what you guys have to say. Stuart, I know it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge for you to get all of these stills up. It's gonna be fun. But this hopefully you guys like have doing. enjoyed this. Please make sure to let me know if you enjoyed it. If you're just, if you're not a follower, make sure to subscribe. If you are a follower um, and you want to become a member with some additional perks in addition to just all of these free videos, then you want to join. Do that on your computer by going to my main page on YouTube. And Stuart, have we forgotten anything else? I don't think oh, so. Oh, there, there is one other thing. If you've made it to the end, I'm going to be, speaking of my book, I'm going to do a book signing at Plant People this weekend from 1 to 3 in Midtown. And I would love to see you there. And also be ready next Wednesday we're going to do our first live Wednesday walkabout in the evening at 6 central standard time get your glass of wine or your cup of coffee or your cup of tea or your iced tea whatever your beverage of choice is and we can walk around together so there you go a very long and I think very special episode for you guys and here you go. Here's your outfit of the day. My sunglasses kind of have that John Lennon vibe and I got these online. They're just inexpensive ones. My earrings are these wonderful silver hoops. I like these so much. And by the way, you guys, I don't know if I've ever mentioned, these are not heavy at all. They're very lightweight. So they're, yeah, they look heavy, I think, but they're, they're hollow. So they're not heavy at all. Um, my fun overalls. I got these online and, and Stuart, we need to put up a link, but I got these online. They are so comfortable. And as much as I love my denim overalls, uh, they're a little bit heavier. These are so lightweight, so they are perfect for summer. And you could wear all sorts of fun tops over them. I just really, really like them. And I especially like them because they have pockets. Um, my boots, these are some new boots from High C, new to me. They're patent leather boots. Again, I love this brand so much because you can just get in and out of them so easily without even having to touch them. And another thing I like about them is the top is really soft so it doesn't cut into your skin. These, I probably, I will save these, my patent leather boots for Sunday, just like when you were a kid and you saved your patent leather shoes for church on Sunday. I will probably save these for apre gardening and wear some different high sea boots when I'm working out working out in the garden. But they also come in, in red and yellow and I just think they're adorable. So there you go, there is my outfit of the day. Well, happy 4th of July, everyone. And I am especially happy on this 4th of July because it is beautiful outside. The sun has finally come out. Last week, we had 12 inches of rain in seven days. And I don't know how much rain we had prior to that. So it's been very soggy. We haven't been able to be out in our gardens. It really almost wasn't safe. So I am just really thrilled. Fireworks are going off everywhere in my brain because we can all finally be out in our gardens.
So today I want to talk about how we can make our gardens a little bit lower maintenance. Now, when I used to do more consulting than I do now, I would often visit different people and they would, you know, they would say, well, I want a garden like yours, but I want it to be low maintenance. Well, you can have kind of a garden like mine or you can have low maintenance, but can you have both? Well, let's discuss that. So my question for today is, what do you do in your own gardens to try to make it a little bit more low maintenance? It may be something big, it may be something small, but whatever it is, I'm sure it's valuable. So let's definitely share our ideas with each other. Put it in the comments below because I think it's really, really valuable information. So this topic was was kind of catalyzed by a friend of mine who came over to visit my garden. And I was talking about the fact that in the next few years, I really hope to start a move and start another garden someplace else probably here in Oklahoma City. I don't know when that will happen, but I was talking about that. And she said, well, wow, who would want to take this on? And I thought about that, and actually, it's not nearly as labor intensive as you might think, and a lot of that has been intentional on my part because it is not only my life, but it's my hobby. So let me discuss in five different ways why my garden isn't nearly as high maintenance as you might think, and different trip tips that you can incorporate into your own gardens and landscapes to make them a little bit less high maintenance. So let's start out with number one. Reduce the amount of lawn you have, if that is feasible for you. So you guys know that I live in an urban garden in close to downtown Oklahoma City. It's on 0.21 acres. And you all are familiar with the fact that I use lots of gravel and flagstone. I have a massive, or what I consider to be massive, given the scale of my backyard, it fully takes up a third of my backyard space and I don't really have to maintain any of this soft decking area. Now, I do want to answer a couple of questions I get a lot. How was this laid down? Well, this I did have installed by a landscaper. It's on a very even bed of crushed gravel. We then put the flagstone in place, and then we put a decorative layer of pea gravel on top that we kind of swept into all of the cracks and crevices. And I like it so much that I started using it to mulch my pots and also to mulch some garden beds in the background. This doesn't require any maintenance other than my periodically getting a bag of gravel from Lowe's, it's Earth Naturals, I periodically have to refresh it, but how I maintain it on a weekly basis or even a daily basis is I get out my little blower and I just blow the weeds or the rather the dead leaves and things off. Very few weeds actually come up through it and if they do, they're very, very easy to pull. Now, there are other ways you can reduce the amount of lawn that you have. And another way that I did it, both in the front and in the back, as my boys grew up and le needed less space to play and do their superpower moves, I reduced the amount of grassy lawn and I expanded my flower beds. And you can see that pretty much a good percentage of both my front yard and my backyard now are shrubs, they're not lawn. And when I had a real lawn, which I later converted to artificial turf. I have very small amounts of it. But when I had a real lawn, even my small square footage of lawn required tremendous amounts of work in the way of mowing, weeding, fungal control, overseeding, um, fertilizing, watering, edging. That took up a ton of time, and I don't have to worry about that anymore with either my artificial turf or my gravel areas. And, and also, obviously, my, my shrub areas and my garden beds. Is this kind of turf for everyone? No, I'm not saying it is, but it turned out to be a brilliant solution for me because I have a throw rug of a lawn, not a massive expanse of lawn. So that would be my first tip reduce to the extent you can the amount of lawn that you have with some other type 
of hardscaping, soft hardscaping, turf or flower beds. So now let's move on to number two. Well, my number two suggestion would be to reduce the amount of container plantings that you have and those that remain, make sure that they are really large statement making and like small gardens in and of themselves. So you guys know I have a ton of container plantings in the form of my topiary collection, things that I have limbed up and try to make really beautiful specimens. I have all sorts of flowers and scented geraniums in them. I have hanging baskets. I have vegetables. I have herbs. A lot of them are set inside the beds. A lot of them are just staged and scattered about. I have window boxes. I have every size and variety of container planting there is. Now, here is an exercise that I think we can all do and that I did after I spoke with my friend who said who would want to take on all of this. Well, you take away all of the container plantings and you have a severely reduced labor intensive yard. I spend, I would say, a good 50 to if not 75 percent of my time working on my planters, my containers, compositions for those, deadheading them, tending them, pruning them, and I do it all joyfully because it's my hobby and I love it. All of my topiaries, all of those kinds of things. But obviously you don't have to engage in any of those if you don't want to. So if you took away and visually try this exercise, I can take away all of these container plantings and I am left with a very strong, not labor intensive, backyard that consists of largely carefree shrubs and evergreens. So that would be my suggestion for number two if you want a low maintenance garden. Don't make yourself um, a slave to all sorts of container plantings. I love it. It is my joy and my passion, but you don't have to love it as much. So if you took all of these containers away, you would take away a good 50 to 75 percent of the work that's involved in my backyard. So that would be my number two suggestion. And now let's move on to number three. Well, my number three, save your labor for a lower maintenance garden, my number three tip would be plant lots of flowering shrubs and evergreens instead of masses of perennials and annuals. When I first started to garden, I, I mean, it was all about all sorts of color that I could get from annuals and then ultimately perennials, but finally flowering shrubs. Now, why you say? Well, number one, I don't have to really do anything to these flowering shrubs. I have showed you some of my favorite varieties. This is a sweet little sugar shack button bush that I love. Let me see if I can find a flower for you that most of them are still in bud. But behind this, I have all sorts of blooming hydrangeas. I have oak leaf hydrangeas. I have verbern viburnums. I have uh, over here a beautiful pink blooming wajilia that was absolutely magnificent at the beginning of the season. I have my Chinese snowball viburnum. I have not as many roses as I used to, but I do have some roses. And then equally as important, I have lots of really beautiful shrubs with gorgeous foliage. So I rely heavily on different color barberries and spireas and anything that will also turn beautifully as the seasons change in the fall. <clears throat> now, if you look behind this button bush, I've got here a white dutzia. Look at how much space this takes up along with the button bush. And then mounds and mounds of oak leaf hydrangeas behind them, along with a the viburnum. Look at how much space this takes up. Now, translate that, if you would, into a formula that was filled with nothing but perennials and annuals. 
I would have to have masses and masses and masses of both to fill this same amount of square footage. It would be extremely labor intensive, lots of planting, lots of dividing, lots of deadheading, lots of dead foliage removal, and I would really spend all sorts of time having to tend to them. I don't have to do that with these massive shrubs. And not only that, I love the look of them. I think they have much more sophisticated gardening appeal. They have a verticality and they grow higher, unlike most perennials and annuals that I could plant. And I think they have much more subdued, serene, and sophisticated garden color. Now, what they also do is make brilliant candidates for cutting and bringing in size. Because if there's anything that I demand of my garden, it's that I have all sorts of material that is potential for the vase, that I can cut it and I can bring it inside regardless of the seasons. So shrubbery, blooming shrubs, and evergreens tend to be far more for season in their gift giving than any kind of perennials or annuals that are only at their best for a certain amount of time and then they're finished. These gorgeous blooming evergreens and blooming shrubs, these are gonna look great into all four seasons and they will look great inside my vase too. In addition, they take up lots of space and are very, very low maintenance. Very little deadheading, very little fertilizing, and very little maintenance required. So that would be my number three most valuable lower maintenance gardening tip, and that would be plant lots of flowering shrubs and beautiful evergreens to make good garden bones without all the fuss. A question I get a lot is how do I handle weeding? And I'm gonna address that in another video. But right now, let me concentrate on my number four low maintenance gardening tip, and that is plant so densely that there's no room for weeds to take root and grow. So in this garden bed right here that is bordered in this brick and gravel, and by the way, because I know you'll ask, how do I get this beautiful brick border? Well, number one, it, it really circumnavigates the entire garden. It's just set in dirt, it's not hard set in, it's largely mulched in gravel, but when it was laid originally, I just used a spacer in between each brick so that I could make sure that the amount, the void in between each brick was consistent from one brick to another and across the entirety of the border. So inside this brick border, I have planted really densely, and I've planted with some perennials that I know are tough and they're very low maintenance. So I have got some absolutely gorgeous Veronica in here. I've got some common mums. I've got some Sedum Autumn Joy. These are some of my bulletproof perennials that I shared with you in a previous video. Stuart, let's try to remember to put a link to that in the description below, but notice how densely it's planted. And then again, I've got a repetition of some of the same shrubs for their foliage that I used on the opposite side. This is so densely planted that there's very, very little room for any weeds to develop. And what weeds do develop are in the foreground and I can easily pull them, especially after a rain. Now, another factor to consider when you are doing this kind of dense planting is try to select shrubs that don't demand a whole lot of air circulation and room. If you wanted to plant roses this densely or some other kind of shrub that was really prone to powdery mildew, fungal infections, or pest infestation, then it would be a problem. But the ones that I have selected, really it, this dense planting does not bother them at all. And in fact, I think it looks really beautiful the way the different kinds of foliage mix together, blend together, and insinuate their themselves into one another in their branching and in their total plant profile. So I've relied heavily on things like hydrangeas and barberries, wagelias, encore azaleas, boxwood, things that don't need a ton of air circulation to 
uh, to really remain good looking, pest and disease free, and accomplish what I want them to accomplish in the garden. Nana Nandinas are also great for that. You can also use large expanses of a perennial that's really easy care and will spread on its own that makes a beautiful ground cover, something like hellebores. So that would be my tip number four. Do dense planting that serves as a living mulch to keep out weeds, to protect one another and keep moisture in your flower beds. That's my number four. Let's move on to number five. Now let's move on to number five. And this would, I guess, pertain to how you decide to style and maintain your garden. You guys know I love lots of clipped boxwood, clipped topiary. It's where I spend a good bit of my time in maintaining those strong, strong architectural forms. I especially love spherical forms and tall conical forms. I also love a beautifully clipped hedge like this boxwood hedge that surrounds my potage. This is wintergreen boxwood. Right now it's kind of shaggy and intentionally so, partly because I haven't had time, secondly because it's been way too wet to prune any of this and I don't want to introduce any kind of fungal problems because some of those, those wet leaves and those spores that could travel, that would be a vector for disease and other kinds of problems. So if you don't want to spend a lot of time with a highly clipped look in your evergreens, highly tailored, then don't do it. It's far less maintenance to just let these go fluffy, let them grow larger, have a more casual, informal look. That's certainly an option and can be equally as beautiful in different kinds of settings. So in that respect, I think just kind of change the style of gardening that you do ever so subtly. Don't uh, try to get a really formal manicured look. Go with something that's a little bit looser, a little bit blousier, and a little bit, um, let's just say, fluffier. That's definitely an option. And finally, another tip on low maintenance gardening. If you can't do it, save your money, a portion of your budget, and take the time, ask friends, ask for recommendations, ask somebody that's working in a, ne in a neighbor's yard to come and help you. I've gotten to the point in my own landscape where things are either too high or too heavy or just too difficult for me to accomplish on my own. So I'm recognizing my own limitations. So yesterday, because I didn't want the garden to get too out of hand while I was busy, I actually had somebody come over for two or three hours and help me in the garden. Now, this was, this was, a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I had a stretch, I don't have a lot of weeding to do, but after my tree suffered so much damage, on one section of a side yard, I had a lot of weeding to do because it was now exposed to the sun. Prior to that, it was in full shade. So I had lots of friendly weeds coming up to keep me company and I just hadn't been able to pull them. Well, he was not not only able to come and help me just pull out the easy weeds that I could have done myself, but I had all sorts of small trees that had volunteered over there, pecan trees, um, elm trees, uh, just all sorts of different weedy trees that had volunteered, and if I had cut them back to the ground, they would have just sprouted again. In this really wet soil, which is a great time obviously to do your weeding, he was able with his strength to literally pull them out roots and all, and some of those roots were this long. Now even if I tried to do that myself, I don't care how wet the soil is, I wouldn't have had the strength to pull out those volunteer trees, some of which were this long. So that was another bonus on getting somebody to help you that's a little bit stronger than you are. So those are some of my tips um, for lower maintenance gardening. Please share your tips so that we all can spend and more time enjoying our gardens and less time maintaining them. Have a great 4th of July. 
And finally, for those of you who are interested enough to hang along for the fashion epilogue, my outfit today, my 4th of July outfit today, is a top from Target. I believe it's Morona. It's old. I've had it for a very long time. It's 100% cotton. The same white jeans that I had on the other day from Banana Republic, these same sandals I had on a while ago that I also got at Target. They're any day. If I can, I'll put links below. My earrings are made well that I got at Nordstrom Rack. And then I like to just have an assemblage of different bracelets that have meaning to me. This belonged to my mother-in-law. This belonged to my mom. Uh, this one I bought with one of my first paychecks years ago. And this beautiful one is a mosquito repellent wristband. And I will put some links to this below. I have on blue, Stuart has on yellow. And yes, we're both making a big fashion statement today. You guys have a great weekend. Well, I seldom ever discourage you from, I guess, really planting anything because I usually believe that it's just, it, there's not no such thing as a bad plant. It's just the bad usage of a plant. That said, I'm gonna really go out on a limb and I'm gonna say, never plant these things. Um, particularly if you live in the suburbs or you live in a neighborhood like mine where houses are pretty close together because they can just be so pernicious and cause so many problems, both for you, for your neighbors, and in some cases for generations to come. So here's a list of five things I would tell you never to plant. And I'd also like to point out that I have worked with clients in the past who have said that they were getting ready to plant something and I have told them, don't do that. I promise you, you will regret it now and you will regret it ever into the future. And one friend of mine, they went ahead, her husband went ahead and planted it. In that case, it was bamboo. And sure enough, he, he was embarrassed to even talk to me for years to come because I had so emphatically told him not to do it. And he went ahead and did it anyway. And sure enough, it has created him no end of problems. So number one, even though I don't have it growing in my garden, I would have to say, don't ever plant bamboo in your home garden. Now, I have seen it used beautifully, but even in that context, it still has become a problem. Um, so unless you're at the zoo and you're feeding panda bears, do not plant bamboo in your landscape. It will be an issue for years to come. If you think COVID is a problem, plant bamboo in your landscape and then try to eradicate it almost as, as difficult as a pandemic. So that would be number one, and thankfully I don't have any of it in my garden. Number two, wisteria. And I know some of you guys are gonna argue with me and you're going to say that there are probably varieties that are not so vigorous and not so aggressive and you can probably look into some of those. Um, but I would say you just have to really practice due diligence before you plant any kind of wisteria because so often it's mis mismarked and it will become as aggressive and as problematic as the bamboo. And I will give you a case in point. My neighbors planted it on their fence um, probably about 10 to 15 years ago, and it has been an issue for them and me ever since then. It grows all along the top of my fence. I am constantly battling it. I constantly have to cut it back. It sends up feeders absolutely everywhere. And not only that, follow me over here because I want to show you something. This is a perfect example of being a really responsible gardener and knowing what you're planting beforehand. I want you to look at this power pole, this disaster. I feel like I should be playing psycho music or something right now because look at that. That wisteria has scaled the entire length of my fence 
proceeded north and now has completely scaled to that power pole. And frequently, yes, it does take out our power and they have to come and they have to cut all of those very thick and vigorous canes back it is just a nightmare. You can see some of it, Stuart, if you can point to some of it growing out of my arborvita. And not only that, but it can be very destructive to your fence line. So if that doesn't uh, convince you not to plant an aggressive form of wisteria, I don't know what will. Yes, it can be beautiful, but unless you have really committed to training it on a support that can handle it, then just don't do it. And I'm not kidding. Think about generations to come. If you plant it at a home, at a restaurant, any place, and you think, well, I'm just really going to keep it tamed, just know that once it's there, it will practically be there into perpetuity unless you use something really dangerous and you nuke it. And I don't advocate using nuclear devices in the garden in general and there in particular. So that would be my number two. Now, not quite as much of a problem, but equally as obnoxious, I guess, um, would be Virginia creeper. Now, at least Virginia creeper has a few things in my garden to redeem itself. It too is scaling the heights of that power pole and even these uh, abhorred power lines that run behind my, my house. But at least it is easier to remove. You can pull it out and pull it away from your fence fairly easily. So it's not quite so much of a problem as, as it could be otherwise. You can pretty much easily cut it back. Yes, it will send out runners, but again, it's a little bit easier to tame, though not a lot. So come this way with me. It too, now this homeowner inherited it. They inherited it from the previous homeowner who inherited it from the previous owner prior to that. Um, and it does, I will have to say, in its defense, back here in the potager, if you come back here, you can see, and I get asked this frequently, what is crawling along the top of my fence? And that is Virginia creeper. And I can cut the top of it. Uh, it doesn't really do nearly as much damage in terms of practically taking down the fence. The vines aren't quite so thick, and it does provide a certain softness to the top of the fence, and it turns a pretty color in the fall. That said, it's extremely prone to whitefly. It's overly vigorous. It too sends up shoots absolutely everywhere, and in instances where I have a climbing rose or something, it will intertwine with that climbing rose, and keep it from blooming optimally. And then I have to get inside that thorny bush and I have to remove it from those canes. So that is also an issue. So come back here. And you'll notice that most of these things are have a vining growth habit. So I'm gonna show you another example right here. Look, Stuart, this, is some trumpet vine growing up in my flagstone and I keep pouring boiling water on it but it keeps rearing its ugly head because yes there is also trumpet vine that grows along this fence. Now I have seen trumpet vine used appropriately in the countryside um, and in areas that have a huge landscape and can accommodate its size and its girth. And it is a great pollinator. Hummingbirds love it. The monarchs love it. But again, if you can try to get a cultivar that's a little bit less aggressive and a little bit better mannered because it can really be a problem. Okay, so that was bamboo, wisteria, uh, Virginia creeper, trumpet vine, 
And then for my fifth one, I would just say know your own landscape. There are going to be some things in your area, uh, in your geography that you should never ever plant. In some cases, it might be oxeye daisies. In some cases, though not here, it could be Nandina. It could be Carolina jasmine. Some people will never ever plant English ivy. So as a broad category, my number five recommendation of things to never plant is something that you know to be an issue in your geography, in your climate, and where you live. So that would be my list of five things never to plant in your own garden. I'm gonna save you a lot of heartache down the line by listing those for you, all five of them. My friend Alex, who's here watching a shoot today, told me that my jacket reminds her of that. She used to watch it when she was little. And I kind of was familiar with that reference, but not 100%. But I am familiar with five reasons why you might want to save, if not hoard, these heavy plastic nursery buckets. Because I do. Partly because I'm thrifty, partly because I don't want them to end up in the landfill, and most importantly, because they are just brilliant in executing their job in the garden. So let me tell you some of the reasons why I hoard and hold on to these plastic buckets. Number one, I love to use baskets in the garden, like this one. And you may recall earlier in the season, I had these framing the entrance to the potager and they were filled, spilling over with scented geraniums and all sorts of different kinds of plants. Now, I obviously did not plant directly into the basket, but I did put a liner in here that then protected the basket. And what I love about that is when that season is done with those kind of cascading annuals and seasonal color, I can then take this out and then just plop in another one that I have in reserve that's already growing and maturing and looking good. So they're really wonderful for that reason. Here's another example of that. I've got one that is just sitting here inside of this basket. So that's reason number one, they are wonderful to just uh, plop and plant. Number two, I love them because it makes moving things into the greenhouse that much easier. These are light, they are portable, and they can work in a way that looks um, substantive in the garden, but they're also kind of temporary. So Stuart, if you would show See this gorgeous Eugenia topiary right here? That is not frost hardy, and that's gonna to have to come in. Now it looks as if it is planted in this concrete planter, but oh no, it's not. It's just sitting in there, and then I've mulched the top with gravel. When it starts getting, when the temperatures start getting really low and when I am ready to haul all of these plants away to the greenhouse to overwinter, all I have to do is just lift this out in its plastic pot and it will then be very easy and very flexible and lightweight to move into the greenhouse. So that's another reason I really like to use them. The other thing that's brilliant about that is when you just set something like these into whether it's a terracotta pot or an urn or a concrete pot. What that does is give it another layer of protection and a way to keep moisture in. So your larger terracotta pots are very, very porous. They wick away moisture very quickly. This is a way to kind of hold on to some of that moisture. The other thing it does is it protects the planter. So I talked in a recent video about ways to protect your terracotta pots. This would be another way. Use a liner inside the terracotta pots so that the moisture doesn't really seep into the sides of the terracotta. 
uh, you know, where there's, there will then be lots of expansion and, contract and, and contraction, and it might make the pot crack, it might make it flake, or whatever. So it will also help the durability um, and the integrity of your terracotta pots. Now, another reason, I guess I'm on my reason number four, is that right, Alex, and my reason number four? Okay, keep me honest. I love them because I think they have kind of a really good modern vibe. So, this is one that I just did a faux finish on, and I'll put a link below to the episode where I showed how to do a faux finish. But there's a way that you can make them look as if they're not plastic, as if they're real. And I'm thinking that next year I'm going to do a whole bunch of these that are in the same shape, and I think I'm gonna do kind of a faux zinc finish on them. That will look really modern, it will look uh, very sleek, and all I will be doing is reusing these plastic pots. The other thing I like about these heavy ones versus some that are a little thinner is that they are just sturdier, I think, and a little bit more formidable, yet still lightweight. So these are gonna be great. And you'll notice that this Silverado Sage here in a topiary form, this is four or five years old, I think. It's in one of these plastic containers and I can just drop it into a basket or whatever. The other place I can just drop it in, and another reason I love these, is because it is drop-in instant maturity and instant seasonal vibe. So in the back where I have a huge mound of, of um, all sorts of autumnal colors, that's actually in a pot, you guys, that is elevated on a plant stand. So if I, let's say in my back border, it's filled with larkspur and poppies and they're absolutely beautiful and then all of a sudden they're gone. Their season is over. If I have a pot like this waiting in the wings filled with annuals and seasonal color cosmos or zinnias or sunflowers, something that's going to fill in the gap after those other early season annuals are finished, all I have to do is plop this in and I have immediate color. It's what they do a lot at uh, public gardens or um, even some private gardens that have to look good year round and it, have, it has to look good immediately without a lot of time to mature and flower and grow in place. So it gives you instantaneous drama and then you can just kind of nestle the pot behind an existing shrub so you don't even know it's there and it gives you beautiful layering and maturity in the garden. Lastly, I like them because not only am I saving these pots from the landfill, but it's gonna help me save some of my current plantings from the landfill or the compost pile as well. Now, many of you have asked, what am I going to do with all of those huge white mums that I planted in the front? Well, when they're done, I'm gonna take them out and I'm gonna plant them all in here. I can then overwinter them in this. They will continue to grow in place. And next spring, when they bloom for the first time, it's going to be a huge white mound of mums that I can then plop in place somewhere for lots and lots of drama. Another reason, so this might be the bonus, a bonus reason, is I also like to save these because this fall, right, oh, let's say, the week or two weeks before Thanksgiving, I'm gonna be potting up and planting all of my spring bulbs for next year. So I really like to use these for container grown bulbs. Again, because they're lightweight, I can store them in the garage and when they get ready to bloom, I can just plop them into a basket. So there you go, five reasons to save these black nursery pots.